Keith Smith, longtime writer for the NBA, contributor for Yahoo Sports. Follow him on Twitter at Keith Smith NBA. We got him on the line. He's joining the conversation right now on 97.3 ESPN on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Keith Smith, what's up, man? Hey, guys. Sorry about that. I did not realize our local grocery store is a dead zone for my cell phone. So now I know. Unbelievable. That's why you got to get the groceries <laughs> online, Keith. Yeah, right. I know. Tell me about it. I'm still living in the uh, uh, 2000s, I guess. And my still God. Going to the store. As if eating is more important than this phone call. Getting the proper I nutrients. Know, right? Yeah. Disgusting, <laughs> Keith. Unbelievable. <laughs> but we have a lot to talk about. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, first, I, I guess we're going to start Sixers because that's what we do here, at least. And let me start with the Charles Barkley and Shaq comments because that's getting all of the attention. That's on all the headlines today uh, on NBA Online, anywhere you look. What are your thoughts about Embiid and how he's played of late? Is it getting overblown or is there something there? He said it himself. He's not having fun. He's trying to mature. His intensity isn't there. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag with Joel Embiid. I think we all want to see him mature a little bit, but I think you want him to still stay the guy he was, the guy who you know goes after people and is on the attack all the time and then isn't hesitant to let guys know about it when he does show them up and make them look bad. And, and that, that passion he plays with is really important. Now, on the flip side, you don't want it to become one of these things where on the court, it's more about clowning guys than it is about playing good, winning basketball. And, and it, it's easy to forget this is still a young guy and he's figuring it out. But I, I don't want to make too much of it because I think overall he's you know better served doing the things he does than you know changing who he is as a player and and the kind of guy he is. But but there's definitely a little bit of something there. All right. So and I want to get more to that in a second. But what are your thoughts on Kawhi Thibel? I mean Matisse. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know, I think he is uh he is showing what everybody expected that he could be a defensive weapon right away and that's right from day one he's been able to be a disruptive player on that end. He has great size and strength for his positions. He's really one of those guys that can defend either guard spot as well as the the smaller big man in the league. And I think eventually as his strength gets even better, he'll be able to switch and hold his own against some of the fours in the league, too. What's been surprising is his offensive game. He's been, I think, a better-than-advertised offensive player right out of the gate, and that's really important for Philadelphia because it still feels like they're still searching. After the starting five, they've got really Mike Scott, and then it's kind of who really knows, so let's see what else we can get figured out. And any minute Bible can give them that are really good is going to be really helpful for them long term. Absolutely. James Ennis has actually been a bright spot coming off the bench, but I don't know if he can like sustain that type of success in that role. Mike, Mike Scott does it sometimes as well, but they are looking for a little bit more consistent depth off the bench. We'll, we'll see how it goes there. But Ben Simmons, he looks like he is finally taking it up another level. He makes another three. Uh, the other night against Cleveland at home. The Sixers are now undefeated 13-0. and Not now, still undefeated 13-0 and at home at the Wells Fargo Center. What have you seen from the team just overall? And do they look like they can really make a run now? Has anything changed with you over the last week or two with them? Not much has really changed for me. They're the defensive team that I think we all thought they would be. They, they're one of the best defensive groups in the entire league. That's really keyed by guys like Simmons and Horford and then Embiid on those nights when he shows up and is a shot blocking and rebounding force. That's, that's really tough for opponents to kind of handle. What is then interesting, I think, today with them is the offense is starting to maybe come around a little bit. Now that's important. Again, that's Simmons keys that if he's willing to just take those jump shots, that can change things. One of the teams I cover, the Boston Celtics, for years, Marcus Smart was known as a non-shooter. But what, it, but what teams still had to do was they still had to pay attention to him because he wasn't afraid to shoot the ball. Once a guy gets the rep of he will not shoot the ball, that's when defenses can really play completely off them and really mess everything else up for all the other guys. And I think Simmons' ability and willingness to just take those jump shots, that really changes the, the overall complexion of what the Sixers can be. Before the season, Brett Brown mentioned Joel Embiid being the closer. 
now that he's getting double teamed in the post and there's a ton of film on that and he's struggling big time and he even struggles to put the ball on the floor, what do you think about Tobias Harris maybe being the closer? Just because he's more versatile, he can come off of a screen and shoot it, he can take the three, he can take it to the hole. What do you think about Tobias maybe being the closer instead of Joel Embiid? Because he is just struggling and he's turning the ball over late in games. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. That's the challenge with Joel Embiid is the turnovers. You just can't have those if you're going to be a good team and win those games late. So I think Tobias Harris can do a lot of things. What I worry about is if you put the right defender on him, can he get his shot off against guys? He's not a great ball handler. He's he's, a, he's good enough for his position. But if you put some of the top-tier perimeter guys on him, he's going to struggle a little. And he still, yeah, at this point in his career, I don't think we're ever going to see him be a guy who wants to go down in the post and bully guys. So that puts a lot of pressure again on Simmons. I think a guy like Josh Richardson, who's probably their second best creator after Simmons off the bounce, because that's really what it comes down to late in games is you need someone who can, you can throw the ball to and say, hey, go make something happen, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else on the court. And I think that's where Philly's still just lacking a little bit. But, but again, with their young guys, they've got a little bit of room to grow there. But I am with you, and I think it is time to – make Embiid more of a complimentary guy late in game versus a focal point because it's just not happening for them when he's the fo focus. Yeah, definitely. I think Toronto put something on tape for every other team to see when it comes to putting pressure on him and he's, he's not answering the bell. But let's move to, to Ben Simmons and his defense because I, I know how frustrating he is offensively. I've also seen him be very dominant offensively at times as well, specifically against the Cavaliers. But Ben Simmons defending is unbelievable to me. Now, I watch every single game, and I dissect every single play when he's out there just because I admire his work ethic and the way he defends, but he is switching on centers, and he's making other centers foul and getting into foul trouble. It's so impressive to me how he has developed specifically on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, it really is. When you can take a guy who is six foot ten and can really defend all five positions on the floor, there's very few players like that in the entire league. And Simmons is unique in that respect. And and one of the things is he, he has a couple guys he has some trouble with. Those really quick small guards give him a little bit of trouble, but again, he's six foot ten. And then the really big burly centers can still kind of back him down. But it, but that's you know when when you're talking these two extreme outliers on either end, that's not not that big of a worry so it really is impressive what he can do in the fact that he is he doesn't gamble a lot he really understands how to use his size to make a mess of things for other teams and that's that's really tough for other teams to get past it's been impressive really since he came into the league what he can do defensively but I think he's starting to really take that to a new level the Bucks are going for their 16th straight win tonight on ESPN national television Two questions here for you, Keith. One, I want your thoughts on them because they have just been blowing through teams. 16 straight potentially is really enough said. But number two, uh, Giannis is out tonight. Uh, how serious is that injury or is that just the Bucks sitting him? Uh, because the whole load management topic is obviously uh, an interesting one. Yeah, I'll start with the Giannis thing. All indications are it's not overly serious. They're not too worried about it. It's more of just the hey, let's make sure this doesn't become a thing. Let's let this guy rest up here in a game that even without him, they should still win. And even if they don't, as you said, 16 or 15 in a row going into tonight, but losing one is not the end of the world. As far as the Bucks overall, it's starting to look a lot like last year where they really rampaged through the regular season on a historic level. That was something that really, I think, caught people's eyes when you started looking back and saying, whoa, wait a minute, this point differential, this amount of wins, these things, this is stuff that the Warriors have been doing the last couple of years. This is pretty impressive, and that's, that's the kind of team they are. But what unfortunately is going to be the question is when we get to April and May is can you do it when it really counts? Because that's always been kind of the knock on the Mike Woodenholzer teams is you can put together these fantastic regular seasons, but if you can't win in the playoffs, what, what good is all of it then? Yeah, absolutely. Now, how it relates to the Sixers, what what type of challenges do the Bucks present? More of the same stuff. Do you think this Sixers team now, the way the Bucks have been playing through this 15-game winning streak, can handle them in a seven-game series? They've had success against them in the past. 
Yeah, that's where a guy, guys like Al Horford and Joel Embiid have to be big, and especially Horford. Horford, when he was with the Celtics, gave the Bucks all sorts of trouble because he's able to pull Brooke Lopez out. I think if those two meet up in a playoff series, I would be surprised if you don't see Horford and Embiid. Maybe they start the game together, but a few minutes in, they each half, Brett Brown splits them, and then you don't really see them again together because then you can really play that 5-0 offense that's been about the only thing that's given Milwaukee trouble on that end of the floor offensively though the Bucks can spread Philadelphia out because it's really for them it's about playing five guys out putting the ball in Giannis's hands and letting him do things and when he can do that that's tough now Horford is probably about as good a defender against Giannis as there is in the league but he still even has trouble and that's that's the problem is when you get there now I know Embiid's had moments where he's done well against them but you don't want to be asking him to defend Giannis for 30 minutes a night over a seven game series because it's probably just not going to go too well for Philadelphia yeah that'd be a tall task for anyone and now the game before that that's the late game on ESPN the game before that is Clippers at Raptors Kawhi will be receiving his ring before the game returning back to Toronto for the first time talk about that matchup and I'll get to the Raptors later because they've been playing exceptionally well a lot of surprises there but talk about that matchup tonight yeah that should be a fun one and I think you're gonna see kind of a a uh, hero's return and welcome for Kawhi Leonard. I think the Raptors fans are very grateful for what he did, getting them all the way to and winning the NBA Finals. And I think they're going to show that love to him. I think there was a good understanding from that fan base of, hey, this might only be a one-year thing, so we're going to enjoy the heck out of it while we have it. I, is it you're going to have a handful of people who boo because there's always a handful of people who boo. But overall, I think it's going to be a very positive welcome for them. The Clippers are still kind of – figuring things out. I think they've really hit the point in the regular season where they've said, we don't really care about the regular season. If we, As long as we finish in the top four seeds, that's all that really matters. We need to get to the playoffs with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George healthy and ready to go because that's what's most important for us. As for the Raptors, they're, they're playing really good basketball too. And, and you know, it's, it's been exciting to see them really get out there and, and defend this title the way they have. How legit is this Miami Heat team? They're now 18-6, and six, and I always assumed at some point that they would fall off. But they are not falling off. They're actually coming off of an emotional win against Trey Young where Trey Young thought the game was over, started talking <laughs> smack, and, of course, Jimmy Butler gets in the mix. So how legit is this team? Yeah, they're really legit. They are one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, maybe one of the best teams in the NBA. They've got good depth. They've got depth at the positions that really matter along the wing. They can throw any number of guys up there. They've got about four or five different guys who can do a lot of different things on offense and defense. That allows them to be very versatile. Jimmy Butler has given them exactly what they needed, a guy who can take over games when they need it most. And they've been going through a lot of injuries. I don't know. I want to say it's only once or twice so far this season that they've had all of their main guys that they've planned to have together out there on the court. Now, everybody goes through injuries, but to have that be the story here in early December, that that's a little interesting. So I think they're a team that they're, they're built to last, and I don't think they're going to go away in the East. I don't think I need to ask you how legit LeBron James is, but that Lakers team right he's now. He's okay. Yeah, he's, he's all right. <laughs> that, that Lakers team right now is playing really good basketball, and I just want to get your opinion on LeBron because he got injured last year. The Lakers fell apart, and it's almost as if everyone wrote him off because of where he is at his – Let's Stage be real. Career, yeah, yeah. Towards the end. What are your thoughts on LeBron James and the way the Lakers are playing? Yeah, I think this year more than any other proves that even robots need a little downtime to get it uh, <laughs> rebuilt because he is just, he is unbelievable. I think it is, you know, it, it, the, the kind of the worst thing that could have happened for the rest of the league was LeBron being able to kind of mail in an entire season. And that's now you're seeing him come back at this thing with a vengeance. And Anthony Davis is the perfect running mate for him now at this point in his career. He can really transition to being a playmaker and still score when he needs to. But you, you can tell how much fun he's having setting up Anthony Davis. But more importantly, they have just the perfect cast of characters around those two guys. Now, a lot of 
people have said, well, what happens when a team is able to hold LeBron and AD in check? Well, that's not going to happen very often. There's only a couple teams that can maybe even think about doing that. But if that does happen, yeah, that's a question. Who's going to step up? But as it stands right now, you want guys who can defend, rebound, and shoot the ball around them. And that's what the Lakers have. So they are really, you know, good job by Rob Blinken to fill out that roster with guys who make a lot of sense around his two superstars. I don't know how much you talked about this with uh, Gil, Keith, last week or the week prior, but I want to bring this up to you. Carmelo. Melo has resurrected his career, dare I say it. Uh, you know, the first week back, he won Western Conference Player of the Week. The Blazers, still been a disappointment. Uh, but to talk about Melo and that team out there in general. What's going on with them? Yeah, one, you, you got to feel good for Carmelo Anthony, the fact that he has got back on the court and really been a productive player. He's able to prove he still has NBA minutes left in him as a good player and can contribute to a winning situation. They they won a bunch of games when he first uh, rejoined the league and signed with Portland, and now they've kind of slipped back. Their problem is they just don't have enough depth. They are really challenged. They're one of the more top-heavy salary situations in the league with Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, and Hassan Whiteside. That's three very high salaries, and that makes it tough to fill out the rest of, rest of the roster around them. And then when you lose a guy like Rodney Hood, that really hurts. And Yusuf Nurkic hasn't played all year. They haven't really had a power forward to speak of all season because Zach Collins, their young big man, got hurt so early on, and he's still question if he really is a four or not. He's probably more of a five. So a lot of people believe they've got to trade in them. Challenge is if they go out and trade for a guy like Kevin Love, that, again, that just only exacerbates the issue going forward that they're going to remain an extremely top-heavy roster, salary-wise, and that just gets really, really hard to fill out a good quality uh, uh bench around those guys because the challenge becomes they've been drafting in the mid to late 20s most seasons so you're not getting those really good high draft picks either so you've got to make the most of those in there a little hit or miss in that track record as well keith smith follow him on twitter at keith smith nba he joins us every wednesday same time 5 15 if you miss any of his interviews be sure to check out our youtube channel 97.3 ESPN. Keith, it's always a pleasure talking to you, man. Go get those groceries. Take them home. <laughs> That's the plan. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.